this book. Uh, it's called Tending the Wild. It's actually, uh, yeah, so it's actually, uh, it looks, it reads like it's uh, um, basically rewritten from somebody's dissertation. And it's about um, Native American management, Indigenous people's management of California's ecosystems. And if you want to know if I'm from California, so I was really interested in it. But if you want to know what California looked like before um, European settlement, it's really, really, really interesting. There was, yeah, I, I'm not going to go into it because if, unless you're from California, you're probably not too interested in it. But the idea was that indigenous people use often used fire in California. Of course, there was a lot of different tribes and different groups, and um, not everybody used fire. For example, the ones on the coast didn't really use fire as much as the ones in the hills um, towards the east. But what we see is that indigenous people did use fire. And because um, when Europeans came through and settled and took the land, um, they didn't want to bring fire and they didn't want to use fire in the ecosystem and basically basically you have that grow up of biomass because this ecosystem is used to being burned on a regular basis and if you don't have any more fire in that area then you end up with an over a few a fuel overload and that basically has led us to the point where we are today where we're worried about lightning strikes or PG&E's um, wires like sparking randomly in the foothills and burning down like millions of acres of habitat in towns and stuff. So that's basically how what led us to that, that in climate change, but it was the increase of this biomass and this burned forest that was used to being burned but was no longer burned for centuries um has made it just basically um basically a haystack and ready for conflagration yep um it is a cool book it's thick and um kind of wordy but it is really interesting okay so we will go on to the third lecture all right, so the outline for this talk is um, I'm going to go over like five different indigenous management styles, uh, not just like thinking about. Um, well, actually, I guess it wouldn't be indigenous management styles, it would be more like um, what they sort of like to lump under conservation styles. So this idea of conserving resources. And then we're going to look at quantitative evidence. Did these uh, kind of styles or do they do these styles actually work? work? And then we're also going to talk about the myth of the pristine forest. And then um, for Thursday, what we're what I'm going to actually do is uh, I'm going to we're going to I'm going to discuss Western management, the roots of Western management and conservation. Um, going back to the 800s and we're going to look at how that sort of fits into these five different um, conservation styles that I'm mentioning right now and we're going to sort of like compare and contrast etc okay so Customary management is just a term for local practices designed to regulate the use and access of in the transfer, transfer of resources. And so with indigenous people, it's based on generations of experience. Again, it's embedded in the culture and it is adaptive. And there are about five that I'm gonna go over. There's a lot more than that, but these are like the major five. So, the first is spatial restrictions. So areas that are restricted to certain or all activities, depending on who the person is, um, 
for example, sometimes uh, sacred groves or sacred forests, shamans or chiefs or wise men or women can go into these areas for very specific purposes and for a very limited time, but normal people basically can't. And I'm showing these two pictures. This is a uh, this is um, a sign from a, a sacred forest in South Africa, I believe. <clears throat> and this sacred forest, only, only the chiefs can go in there. And it's very rare. I think they only go in there when they're actually getting buried in there. It's like a tomb area. But if you think about it, spatial restrictions and areas that people can't go into, um, it's much like a nature reserve or a wildlife reserve or um, a protected area. So <clears throat> as I was mentioning, uh, a Western form of this is national parks, strict wildlife reserves, marine protected areas, and other forms of that. For indigenous people, the forms are usually sacred groves or forests or hills or mountains. Um, there are also sacred ponds and other bodies of water. I'm pretty sure that there are sacred lakes, but I didn't find anything like that in my reading. Um, there's also shrines and then tombs, and then there are also more temporary closures. So this is where, uh, for example, in the Pacific Islanders would close reefs or lagoons for a small amount of time, certain reefs and lagoons for a small amount of time just to protect the resources there. We'll go into that a little bit more. So these are basically the first protected areas. Um, it's a global and across religious phenomenon. So you can see sacred forests in Christianity. You can see sacred forests or sacred sites in um, Islam, in Judaism. Uh, it, and they're thought of, these areas are thought of as homes of the gods or spirits or ancestors and because these are these like really holy sacred areas, you don't want to go into them and you don't want to destroy them basically. <laughs> and the restriction intensity, intensity varies like I was mentioning. Um, some areas no one can go into at all. And then some areas are just open for special people like shamans or chiefs. And then some areas are open for like a very limited amount of time where normal people can go in and maybe like collect a flower or something, but you have to do all these specific and really important rituals to show respect for the resource that you're gathering. And you have to sort of, it's sort of like um, leave nothing but footprints, but it's even more restricted than that. Um, you sort of like, make sure that nothing is disturbed when you go um, when you leave from that area. So in the background of this slide is a Christian church forest from Ethiopia. <clears throat> and you can see that the forest is obviously um, protected. It's protected by a wall, but around it are all these uh, farm fields. So like I was mentioning, um, the restriction of them varies. There's this uh, from this paper, uh, Negi 2010. You can actually see that. Um, I cannot actually see what is going on here. Okay, so on the left, on the left of the slide, you can actually see that there are four different sacred forests. And you can see that they are obviously, the habitat is obviously different from the surrounding area. So um, you have this forest over here and then you have this hillside that is uh, deforested, probably farmland. Um, and this, this is a sacred pond who controls these areas. So the people who control these areas are um, people like chiefs. Um, and the people who have power 
through the indigenous religious customs or um, belief system. So, let's go. Yeah, so these, uh, these people who have social power and religious power, sort of like they have the knowledge of, I guess I wanna, I wanna sort of, uh, what do you call it? Compare it to a priest where this person in the, in the community has this knowledge, it's usually religious based and um, they're saying, no, this is an area you do not go in because of this and this and this. And if you do go into it, you have to do these rituals. So people will go to them before they do go into these areas and like they'll give offerings and they'll say, okay, how do I actually um, go into this area without harming or disturbing or angering the gods? or spirits and getting cursed or something like that. So it's people within the community that are in control of these areas. It's a very uh, decentralized um, management system. But what I was seeing, okay, so right here you have a sacred pond where no one uses the water. And actually a uh, wildlife goes over here. And uh, so tourists can like stop off on a hill or hillside or something and actually take pictures of animals that they wouldn't be able to see naturally um, or regularly. This area, this one right here, this uh, the one on the top right is a sacred forest that they say that not even the spirits go in, which is, <laughs> it was really, uh, it was really uh, shocking to me. Um, this idea of this area that uh, the sacred, but not even the spirits go in. So you kind of wonder what it is or who it is that is within this area that is so terrifying that the spirits don't even go into. Um, so on the slide uh, on the right is just a list of areas that have sacred forests or sacred groves. And it's just to show that, um, yeah. There's different types of sacred sites. So you have ponds, you have reefs, you have uh, forests, groves, hills, etc., and they're all over the world. This is uh, these are two examples of more of a, a shrine slash, slash tomb situation. So on the left is a picture of uh, Mugger or Muger, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but a, a crocodile species that is listed as vulnerable by the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And it's a crocodile species that um, sort of finds refuge in this tomb. And it's called the Jahan Ali Shrine. And so basically someone that is really important to this uh, local culture is laid there and no one disturbs the area. So you have this area where crocodiles can be and uh, sort of grow up to be unharvested. And then on the right side, you have this uh, picture of another tomb. It's called the Bayazid Bustami tomb and it's in this city, which is interesting, but um, it's home to this turtle, which I think personally is very ugly. I thought it was just hideous looking, but the turtle <laughs> lives in this pond in the shrine. And uh, it's so rare that it's, it's listed as extinct in the wild by the IUCN. So this is the only place this turtle species is in the entire world. Um, so it's this, this idea of this sacred site that can't be disturbed is very important for this one species of turtle. All right, um, so 
there's a ton of names for these uh, sacred sites. The Muzumu in Southern Kenya. Did the indigenous people protect these areas with the intent of protecting the species or is it just an added bonus? It was definitely um, the latter. It's an added bonus. And there's a lot of, there's like a lot of debate about whether indigenous people actually have conservation ethics and whether they know how important it is to conserve resources because there's an idea that unless you've lost resources, then you can't know that it's important to conserve them. And I kind of wanted to go into it in this class and I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to do that on Thursday. Um, but yeah, it's, it's for the most part, it's definitely the latter, um, sort of the indirect side effect. Uh, the Mizumu in Southern Kenya are these riverbanks that uh, fishers don't go. So they all not fish from those riverbanks because they're sacred um, to these water spirits in this area. Uh, Shinto forests in Japan and the Feng Shui uh, forests in China. And then you have sacred areas in Tibet, and which was really interesting. So you have this uh, idea in conservation and island biogeography, this idea of habitat patches that are bigger being better for species than habitat patches that are smaller. So in Tibet, they'll have really expansive uh, sacred sites, sacred mountains, because uh, the Buddhist lamas, the religious uh, figures in this culture, believe that uh, bigger areas are less likely to be disturbed in a manner that would upset the spirits. So you still get this idea of protecting a bigger area, just so you do not disturb the spirits. Um, so I thought that was cool. Uh, let's see. So what I was mentioning was that um, there are varied habitat types that are protected under this idea of sacred areas. Uh, we talked about hills, forests, ponds, lakes. Um, riverbanks. Um, there are mangroves, freshwater swamps, and other tropical forest types that are protected under this. There are oases in the desert that are protected like this. Um, and these areas are incorporated into human life. So it's not that, it's not that it's this area that people sort of go on a pr pilgrimage to. Um, and then they leave and they never return until a year later. It's actually, it's an area that would, like if you would step outside your door, um, like if I looked outside, this would be, this could be a sacred area right here, right outside my window. And there would be customs and rules that I would have to follow to um, even go into it if I could go into it. So these areas are incorporated into human life. They're not separated from human life. So this is just a picture that is showing um, a sort of a diagram of this uh, indigenous culture's landscape setup, I guess. Uh, so you have these uh, this uh, die villages. So the little buildings right here, they're the die villages, uh, and then you have this forest right here, which is used. Um, so they'll go into the forest and they'll cut down certain trees for use. <clears throat> and you have the farm fields and you have the rivers, but then on the other side of the river bank, you have the Nong Ming, which are these holy hills, which are forested and protected and worshiped. And um, Zhu et al. 2005 found that there was a high concentration of endangered and endemic plant species within these Nong Ming. Uh, these holy hills. And then another example of this is Hanai, Hani, Hani Cemetery Forest. Um, there are also like graveyard forests in Pakistan that are um, sort of these sacred undisturbed areas. And like, if you think about um, like a graveyard here, uh, people don't go into graveyards and chop down trees or you would hope they don't. Right? Usually, I'm actually not sure 
<laughs> um, um, so on the West, we have very, uh, very, we have planned graveyards, right? Um, and they're usually large. And the one that I know doesn't have any trees because it's just, uh, it's too dry. And so there's just like lawn. But I lived in an area in Virginia where I would walk past um, this small graveyard. It was like just two gravestones. And um, on one side was like a parking lot and on the other side was an apartment building. And then you have this graveyard in the middle, which is still forested. So um, that's where I'm basing my experience off of. But I, I don't know, maybe people do go into graveyards and chop down trees. I would feel uncomfortable doing that. <laughs> and I'm not sure about you guys, but that's what I would feel uncomfortable with. Um, okay, so I mentioned temporary spatial restrictions. Uh, this idea of Pacific Island are sort of setting aside these certain reefs and lagoons uh, um, and sort of making them uh, closed for the time being. And uh, this time can range from several weeks to a year or more. So it's not necessarily all that temporary, but, um, and the reasons would be to recover overfished species, sort of make them easier to capture. So sort of have it so that they sort of forget that they're being fished. Okay, next part. Um, we'll be talking about temporal restrictions. So this idea of uh, periods where resource use is restricted um, across space. And uh, these can be sporadic. So it could be like a shaman or a wise man goes outside and um, looks at the resources and is like, you know, we should not use this grove for at least a week just to sort of let it recover. And this would actually, um, yes, Samoa, um, during periods of severe drought or after cyclones, um, people like pe local people with status would basically be like, okay, we can't use uh, coconuts at this moment because um, the trees are still recovering from the cyclone. So, or they're not able to get enough um, water because we have a drought. So um, no coconuts this uh, for this year, but next year, maybe we'll be able to harvest coconuts. So it's this idea of resources being temporally restricted. Um, it can also occur regularly. So we can have uh, rotations on daily, weekly, seasonal, um, closures Tuesday in coastal uh, in areas in coastal Ghana uh, people don't fish because it's the day of the sea god and so you just you don't fish <laughs> um, a western form of this is just closed seasons so this idea of you don't go and shoot deer in the spring because that's not the season for it uh, for indigenous forms it sort of follows this this principle of uh, letting fields lie fallow or um, rotating certain areas for hunting. Um, so in certain areas in India, people who follow, uh, people who are Hindu, uh, they'll suspend hunting and abstain from meat in August, which is this uh, month called Saravana in Hindu. And it's this peak of the main rainy season. So you have this, this time period, this month, where everything is really productive and you have, um, if I'm remembering correctly, you have animals mating, you have animals nesting, but people will not eat or hunt meat during this period. And you sort of think that indirectly, even though it might not be to protect the resources, and directly they will be protecting resources in some way by sort of letting the wildlife populations recover from hunting during this period. Um, and yes, uh, my last bullet point, these, these periods, temporal closures can coincide with spawning and mating seasons. So does anyone 
have a question. Served by local governments. Yep. Yeah. So it's the local communities. Again, it's all very local, local communities. Um, local cultures will be uh, will set these periods aside. And it will be because it's part of the culture. It's part of uh, their belief system. This is just what they do. On Tuesday, you do not fish because it's the day of the fishing god. You don't fish during that period. And everybody knows this. Yeah, so there is this idea of, um, okay, so it's definitely, so when people break these traditions, they can get fined. They can, um, they can have to pay a certain amount to um, the elders or the chiefs or the shamans. They can um, be punished and a lot of this, a lot of the time, the punishment is sort of like a social isolation. So if you if you live in this community, this small community where everybody sort of knows each other, and then you break this taboo, and no one will talk to you, and everyone will say, "Oh, you know, that's that guy that went into the sacred forest and took down a tree, and like just used it for firewood." Um, and he didn't do the rituals, so we're not going to interact with them because he broke this important tradition among us. Um, yeah, so you have social, sort of a social punishment, you can have financial punishments. Um, and then there's just like a fear of being, of, of pissing off the gods, of um, angering the spirits, of being cursed, of... Um, having your your um finding it harder to hunt because you've pissed off the um the forest finding uh feeling that you might get sick at some point and there will be no one to take care of you because again you went to the sacred forest and cut down a tree and used it for firewood and didn't use the right ritual um so i think i think what i'm trying to get at is that uh in these cases Indigenous people find more, um, they find their social ties and their interactions with their community a lot more important than um, we tend to think of them as Western people. It would sort of be like being ostracized by your family, um, disowned. So if you can think of it in that way, uh, I'm not sure if I'm really getting this across, but. Um, yeah, so these are all just cultural norms. Okay, we'll move on. All right, uh, so we're looking at species focused restrictions. <clears throat> And this idea of uh, certain species not being able to be used or harmed or killed um, due to taboos or a, like a social cultural custom. Um, I used a picture of a rattlesnake that I saw this summer because um, the Cherokee actually have this myth about the rattlesnake uh, saving humans from, ex from being killed by the sun. And so it's taboo to kill it. And if hunters will come across a rattlesnake early in the summer, they'll be like, they'll, they'll say to it, let us not see each other again this summer and hope that they don't come across it again. Um, it's for rattlesnakes, it's kind of, um, it's sort of like a respect slash fear relationship. Um, but for many species, it's more of a, it's more of a pure respect relationship. Rattlesnakes might not be the best example, but I had a picture of it, so. Okay, so uh, taboos and totems have gotten a lot of attention in the literature when it comes to these, um, this idea of indigenous people conserving their resources because uh, if we think about a taboo, 
you can't hunt this animal because it's an ancestor or it could be a reincarnated person or because it's favored by the spirits. And so if you kill it, you'll actually um, get sick. This idea of not being able to kill an animal, obviously for us uh, ecologists and conservation biologists sort of like, it's like trying and we're like, okay, you know, does this, could this actually work as a conservation thing? So there's been a lot of papers on this, um, but let's see, Western forms are obviously like protected species, like um, endangered species for the United States and um, CITES, uh, species protected under CITES um, for international things. Uh, the word taboo comes from the Tongan taboo, which means forbidden and uh, totem, which is another type of sort of species focused restriction um, is an animal or a plant with spiritual significance for certain people. So this can be um, from an individual, like one person to an entire village to an entire like culture. And as I was mentioning before, there's many reasons for these kind of taboos and totem ideas, uh, whether it's because the rattlesnake saved our people way back in the beginning from being killed by the sun or because that could be your grandmother reincarnated or that could be a spiritual helper sort of a guardian angel or they're just dangerous so um there's a lot of examples but i kind of wanted to look at this example and this is in india and this idea of tigers are our brothers and um, you have this sort of, uh, you, you can think of this kind of flippantly where you're like, yeah, you know, animals are our brothers. We're supposed to take care of our brothers. But for these people, the Mishmi, you know, they, they actually mean that tigers are our brothers. There's a myth, like their original creation myth where um, uh, this um, female thing gave birth to a tiger first and then gave birth to a human, the first human. So humans are the younger sibling and tigers are the elder brother. So what, when they mean that tigers are brothers, they actually mean that they are kin. Um, born to the same mother, we kill tigers only as a last option. And so that could be very important and very, a very strong form of protection. Uh, there are other examples that I'm sort of going to go over. So we have this idea of elephants protecting gods in Zimbabwe, and that's why we do not kill them. Um, we have baboons and monkeys being sacred animals. So even if they ruin our crops, we do not kill them. And this is in uh, certain communities in Nigeria. Um, this idea of pythons being sort of paying back pythons and protecting pythons because when our community hundreds of years ago had to escape slave raiders on the coast of Ghana, um, this python in the guise of a log actually saved our village. It led us across a river and it protected us from these slave raiders. So we have to protect pythons and we do not kill pythons. This idea of we do not kill frogs either because when we were thirsty, when our ancestors were thirsty, um, a frog led us to water. Or this idea of we do not kill sea turtles in the same community because um, they protected our ancestors from violent storms on the sea or from uh, slave ships. They sort of led us back to the land. So we do not kill these animals. And so other than um, this idea of a conservation effect on species because of these taboos, you can also think of it as sort of a, I guess a sustainability or I wanna say niche. And if you guys don't know what niche is, niche is sort of this, it's like a position that an animal fills 
a, a place and a time and a diet that is this one species and then another species sort of doesn't cross into that area. Um, and in this case, you have the Inuit and Nuka indigenous people in the Northwest, both hunting and eating whales. And then it makes sense that uh, the Tlingit indigenous people in the same region would say that whales are taboo and you do not eat them. And in that way, you sort of protect this population or the species from being um, overexploited by too many people. Um, yeah, I'm gonna just go away. All right, so um, two final types of restrictions, customary managements are this idea of uh, effort and catch restrictions. So restrictions on who can use a resource and how much can be taken at a time. And this is where we'll sort of, we're going to sort of go into Western management and the oranges, origins of Western management. So if you guys have ever heard about an idea of a Kingswood, um, it's literally mean, it literally comes from this idea of a king's wood. It's a wood that is only for the king to use. Um, so this area that is, uh, unless you're a king, you cannot go into this area. Basically, this effort restrictions, I have a permit kind of deal. And Western forms are licenses and permits, which certain people have to apply, people have to apply for, and you're either accepted and you're given a license or a permit or you're denied one. <clears throat> um, basically focused on who can use certain species or certain areas or certain gear. So we'll mention, we'll talk about it in the next module, uh, this idea of local people not being able to get permits or licenses to hunt um, wildlife because they couldn't afford to get guns, which, or a certain type of gun, which they had to get to be able to get the license or a permit. And um, this sort of being like a financial a financial barrier. So people who are too poor are unable to hunt these animals, whereas the rich are. And so just an example in um, the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, you have this graph where sort of your restricted species, the number of species that you cannot eat at all uh, depends on your age. So at this point right here, when a person is an infant, um, they are unable to eat about, I think that's 80-ish species. They're unable to eat 80-ish species. And this isn't just infants. Um, this is also their parents. Their parents cannot eat 80 species until they move out of this age gap, uh, this age group. Um, and elders can eat basically anything that they want. But the point of this slide was that uh, tons of species are protected within this uh, within this culture of the Nuboti because. Um, you have all these species that are food species that are hunted. You have 57 animal, uh, mammals, you have 108 birds, you have nine reptiles and amphibians and uh, 53, yeah, 53 fish. But at a certain point in time, multiple people within that culture might not be able to eat a certain species because they're within an age group where it's restricted. So in the end, um, 48, like 80% of the mammals are unable to be eaten by certain people within this culture because they're in the wrong age group. And obviously that lessens the exploitation of this resource. And then you have catch restrictions, this idea, and this is more of a, this is more of a, a really 
well, all the other ones were cultural too, but this is really, really cultural. This idea of uh, harvesting only what you need. And if you get a big deer or um, if you get a whale, for example, you share the harvest with everybody and you used all the portions. Um, and so you sort of, maximize the use of this one individual animal and you minimize the number of individuals that other people have to go out and get to get the same sort of resource. So Western forms of this would be bag or catch limits, but Western forms, this idea of bag and catch limits doesn't really apply to this, um, this mindset of not going out and collecting all the blueberries you can just because you can, right? Or sharing whatever surplus you have of food with your neighbors and your family um, because you have it. it. Bag and catch limits doesn't really apply to that, but it was the closest thing I can get to it. Um, we are gonna stop there. But uh, does anyone have any questions? So we ended on talking about um, catch restrictions and this idea of just not taking everything, basically just taking what you need. And now we come to the question of does any of this work? Um, do indigenous management techniques actually conserve things? Even though that tends to not be their purpose, does it happen as a side effect? And um, from what I've been able to find, there's a whole bunch of descriptive uh, studies about what kind of manage management techniques indigenous people use, um, the restrictions, the spatial, temporal, effort, catch, et cetera, but there's not a lot of quantitative studies that actually look at whether um, these customs conserve resources. There's a lot of uh, correlation to the idea of, well, indigenous people have been on the landscape for 10,000 years, for example, in North America, and um, very few species went extinct except for that first time with that first uh, pulse in the upper Pleistocene. So there's that idea There's that idea that if all those species still existed by the time Europeans got here, then obviously they were doing something right to conserve them. And we do see that there is examples of indigenous people using resources sustainably, for example, with the goals and how the indigenous people use their knowledge of reproductive biology to harvest skull eggs without decimating the population. But again, it's not a lot of, it's not a lot of causation. And you only get causation when, um, you only get causation when, okay, there we go. You only get causation when you actually have experiments. Um, hopefully you guys have learned this by the time, uh, how far you went, you are in your degree. Experiments are what you get, or is how you get the actual cause of things happening. Um, a lot of the stuff that we do as ecologists is a lot of correlation, usually because of the kind of animals that we work on and the kind of questions that we ask, but again, so the few studies that I have been able to find um, some numbers to, it was mostly a lot of spatial restrictions kind of studies. So they looked at sacred sites, sacred groves, sacred forests, sacred shrines, et cetera. And it does seem that these spatial restrictions work for um, conserving species. For example, there's higher plant species richness usually found in these sites. And this was across the globe. Um, there's higher bird species richness, high butterfly density, 
um, in Ghana. And there's often different types of species communities present in these forests compared to outside of the sacred site. So what they were seeing is that a lot of the birds and butterflies in this example were um, specialists or um, species that tend to tend to leave, tend to be extirpated from a site as soon as a little bit of disturbance comes into the into play. So we have a lot of specialists and uncommon birds and butterflies in these sacred areas compared to the more generalist species that occur outside of that sacred area. For taboos, I found um, two studies on gibbons and orangutans, and they found that uh, there, were, there was higher gibbon survival outside of villages um, that had stronger connections to their cultural, cultural customs, uh, where the taboos were still present in everyday life. And uh, same thing in, I think this is Borneo. Yeah, I think this is Borneo. Um, where there's more orangutan nests outside of areas that had stronger informal institutions, these taboos were still in play in everyday life. So they didn't hunt gibbons or orangutans. But the problem with depending on cultural customs, unfortunately, is that these customs can erode. And we'll be talking about that more in the next month or so. But this idea of the world modernizing can actually influence whether taboos are still believed in, whether cultural customs are still adhered to, et cetera. So in this example, we have, uh, for example, two communities, one that's a little bit more modern, uh, doesn't have, doesn't place as much um, emphasis on taboos and traditional customs and slow lorises aren't present in those areas. Um, but in areas where the community still had the strong taboos in place, so slow lorises were actually living like adjacent to the villages, which is unlikely habitat for them um, because we tend to think of them as uh, disturbance, disturbance intolerant. Whereas it seems that the problem is that the culture has changed in a lot of areas. So slow, slow lorises aren't protected by these cultural customs. In another example, in Southwest Madagascar, you have sacred caves. And on the left, you'll see uh, examples of these sacred caves. You'll see, um, I think in 2B, you'll see uh, bottles of the local uh, alcohol that they create, the tokogasi, and um, some goat's blood that someone left. But what happened, what they found there was that 75% of the interviewees didn't actually recognize the sacredness of these caves. So there was no protection for the bats that lived in these caves. So let's talk about the myth of the pristine. This isn't gonna work on that. Um, there's a whole bunch of papers that have looked at how, whether forests were disturbed before European colonization occurred. So did indigenous people hundreds, hundreds, thousands of years ago actually um, influence their forests through either fire or clearing? A lot of these papers happen to be in, um, South America, for some reason. There's a few that uh, we can find in Africa. You'll see that one on 
uh, the top, the animation doesn't work on this part, but um, you'll see that they looked at how the forest changed um, in Uganda hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But what we see here is this idea of in the Amazon, you have this idea of um, hunting sort of being spread across the Amazon basin because people are gonna go, you know, they're gonna hunt in a whole bunch of different areas. They're gonna go explore new areas to be able to hunt in those places. But it has kind of a lower effect on today's environment, right? So if people take out, even if they take out hundreds and hundreds of animals, thousands of animals, tens of thousands of animals over centuries, it's not gonna have that big of an effect on today's environment in that area. But once you look at um, more habitat focused changes, so this idea of wildfires, um, clearing land, using that land for agricultural fields, uh, clearing land for settlements, for villages, you'll see that it's more focused, it's more localized because people aren't gonna be living everywhere during that period, but the change has a higher effect on today's environment. And then, like I mentioned, um, there's upheaval in Uganda, pre-colonial upheaval. And we see that the environment did change during that time. I think it was, I think it was uh, population, there was a population boom and more of the forest got cleared, but then due to this upheaval, more people moved away. And so you have um, forests sort of taking back that land that was cleared and is no longer used. So there's also a few studies in Europe that I was able to find and uh, Europe has been under the influence of people, of course, um, ever since Neanderthals occurred. And I suppose it must be because, uh, maybe because the land isn't as large, Europe isn't as large as the continent of Africa, but it seemed like Europeans had a, a much harder influence on European habitat than Africans or South Americans did. And this might be, be due to um, differences in lifestyles. So you'll see in uh, the next lecture that we'll go over, um, there were a lot of pastoralists in Africa. So they had, uh, there are people that were herding animals and they cleared land for their animals to graze on but they were hurting them and they were sort of moving across the landscape. Whereas in Europe, it seemed that more people were uh, focused on agriculture. So they were using the same fields every year. And as the population um, continued to grow, you see more of that land being cleared to create more food. Either way, um, so a quote from this paper is this idea of 0.2% uh, of a central European deciduous forest type being left in its relatively natural state. So everything else is basically disturbed or has been disturbed in the past. So takeaways. Indigenous do have a lot of ways of managing resources. Hopefully by this time, you guys understand that. Um, but there isn't a lot of quantitative information on whether they actually work. And because it's based on culture, um, due to modernization, westernization, and the changing times, it might be less effective. And to just uh, emphasize this, there is no such thing as a pristine forest or a pristine habitat or a place that humans have not been, except for Antarctica. 
yeah, except for Antarctica, um, has have not historically influenced uh, either through hunting or through agriculture or through habitat changes using fire, et cetera. And this is important to understand because um, Europeans tended to use the whole idea, the myth of the pristine forest, um, the tropical Eden that Africa in South America and um, Southeast Asia were supposed to be as as a way of romanticizing and I wanna say lessening the effect that local people had on their environment. Um, making it so that it was easier to sort of consider this area, this land, this habitat, this forest as unclaimed and not being under anyone's ownership. So it was easier to take. All right, does anyone have any questions before we move into the next lecture? Actually, it's not gonna be a next lecture. It's gonna be um, a video first because I remember one of you guys asked about whether indigenous management uh, customs can scale up. And I looked for some information on that and I found a video that I think you guys might find interesting. It's based in Australia, but um, we're gonna watch that first and then we're gonna move into West, where Western management basically came from. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah, definitely. Um, yes, so uh, missionaries, the idea, the advent, the introduction of Christianity was used to erode indigenous beliefs and cultural customs. And that did in fact affect the environment. Once you no longer believe that, um, for example, the gods, the spirits exist in a forest, then you don't see a reason to keep the forest anymore, right? You don't see a reason to see it as sacred and hold it sacred and not use it. But there's also, well, I, I, th I think I'll just leave it at that. But one quote that a lot of people like to throw around um, is this idea of, uh, and I'm gonna see if I can Google it so I get it right. Yes, so a quote by Desmond Tutu is, uh, when the missionaries came to Africa, they had the Bible and we had the land. They said, let us pray. We closed our eyes. When we opened them, we had the Bible and they had the land. So this idea of religion being um, another way, less forceful, but more insidious as a way to sort of take over control of resources. We're gonna get into that a little bit more. Faith, you asking the ethics situations in which the class. Okay, so so when we say pristine, the word has a good connotation, like you want pristine water, um, you want pristine air, etc. But when I say that there's no such thing as a pristine habitat, there's no such thing as a pristine forest. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. Um, so if you remember what I was, when I was talking about the intermediate disturbance hypothesis and this idea of if you introduce fire and it's not too intense of a fire, it doesn't burn down the whole forest, um, but it's not too weak. It doesn't just burn down the grass blade. And if you introduce it every two years instead of every hundred years or every week, then 
you get this immediate disturbance that provides habitat for animals that in species, plants, etc., that can exist in more disturbed areas and species that can exist in less disturbed areas. You get this sort of um, maximum number of species that can exist in this area because it's intermediately disturbed. So yeah, the effects from humans could um, were definitely positive or neutral for a lot of species. Um, yeah, the idea of things being disturbed seems a little bad, but it's not necessarily bad depending on the context of the situation. So if you have a disturbed If you have a farmland next to a state forest, farmland's more disturbed, right? But as long as there's a state forest there that's less disturbed, that can be the habitat, the source habitat for more specialized species, more species, species that are more disturbance intolerant. And then you can also have species that are more generalist and more disturbance tolerant. So you get sort of a, a mix of communities. Any more questions? By the time the fire got to here, it would have been extremely hot. And so you get a lot of species that come in back that, that don't belong to this country. The bracken acts as an invasive native and it starts choking out the area. It's bad enough that our people have lost our own identity through stolen generation, through being dispossessed from our land. But not only that, because of mismanagement of country, even now countries losing their its own identity through these invasive natives that are, are taking over and choking out areas where they're not meant to be. Here we have an area where we've put the cool fire in after the wildfire. As you can see, we've got the bracken coming back. And in this area through here, the bracken is a lot thinner than say in areas where we haven't put that cool fire in. And by opening up the, the ground here, we're getting different species. We've got like a little lamandra here coming back, a little native grass. And it's just trying to open that country up so that it gives a chance for these, these other grasses and, um, and other little, little herbs and shrubs to come through and not get choked out by the bracken. Okay, so I just thought I'd share that with you guys. Um, so <clears throat> if you guys <coughs> watch the news or listen to the news or anything, uh, you guys probably heard about all the bushfire in Australia last year and how their fire seasons were awful. Um, and so it looks like there, there are certain areas in Australia that are sort of being turned over back to indigenous management and the cultural burns that they were talking about. And he, he mentioned about how it is a science, you know, you have to be able to, you have to sort of know the land to be able to know exactly what it needs. <laughs> 